I was spending the summer working in a village in mid Wales and, without my own car, hitching was the only option. Because it was fun, quick and so much more reliable than public transportation, I carried on. I met so many nice people. Drivers would often go out of their way to take me on my journey or insist on buying me cups of tea and sandwiches. Each ride seemed like an adventure and a new challenge. Then, in April 1980, I was picked up by a man who never told me his name, but was the strangest I met thumbing rides. It was an encounter I would never forget. I used to put the men who gave me a lift into two categories, there were the protective fatherly types who warned me against hitching, and leering chances who made dirty jokes. There was a slipway before the motorway started again and I noticed a blue van parked on it. The man leaning on it was looking over. You want a lift, he asked, walking towards me. It seemed odd he would offer to drive me, without being asked, but because I was caught off guard I told him where I was heading. I'll give you a ride. Throw your rucksack in, he said, motioning to the empty space in the back of his van. I told him I'd rather have it in the front with me, but he replied, it's perfectly safe, don't worry. I tried to insist but he kept repeating that I had nothing to worry about. He even started to get a bit angry. I began to think I should turn down his offer, but I hadn't mastered the art of refusing a lift, it felt rude to say no and I had been brought up to be polite. Then, abruptly, his mood changed. Actually, I feel like a cup of tea, he announced. Okay, I'll just carry on hitching, I said, secretly relieved. But he said I should join him, come for tea. What's the harm in a cup of tea? It was more like an order than a question and there was something about him that made it impossible for me to say no. In the service station he asked all about my family. Sternly, he demanded to know what my parents thought about my hitchhiking. I admitted they were unhappy about it, but they understood it was my choice. That's ridiculous he said, angry again. They obviously don't care about you. No parent who cared about their daughter would let her hitchhike. After telling me I'd never make it home before dark, he invited me to come and stay with him and his family. My immediate thought was that his wife would probably be furious that he had brought home a young female hitchhiker, unannounced. When I tried to defend my parents against his attacks, it just seemed to make him angrier so I let it go. He had a volcanic temper and I remember thinking what an unpleasant man he was, but I wanted to get home and didn't feel physically threatened. In my head I had put him in the fatherly category, he wasn't nice, but he certainly did not seem to have any sexual motive. So when he opened the back of the van again, I relented, throwing my rucksack inside. In retrospect, I think he was very clever at manipulating me, he felt familiar and I didn't want to annoy him further. As we drove back onto the M5 he didn't say much. I didn't either. Then, about 15 minutes down the motorway, out of the blue, he announced I was heading in the wrong direction. I knew he was wrong, but he wouldn't listen. I have to see a friend nearby, he continued. I'll drop you off, you can cross the road and I'll pick you up on the way back if you're still there when I return. I was alarmed because it's illegal to cross the motorway and if I followed his instructions I would be heading the wrong way. I also knew it was singularly unlikely anyone would stop for me on the M5. But the volcano erupted again and he even started arguing belligerently that we were not on the motorway at all, despite the blue signs. He was so upset I actually thought he was going to lean across and hit me, 
so when he stopped I did what he had said and got out of the van. I crossed the motorway and watched as he drove off. There was not a car in sight heading my way, but I started walking and stuck my thumb out. Seemingly out of nowhere, a lorry pulled up. When I told the driver where I was going he agreed to drop me back at the service station I had just left. From there I soon got a lift heading back south. I got home late and told my mother and sister what had happened. I wasn't exactly scared by the experience, just curious. But over the years when I thought about that day little things occurred to me. I remembered the man had indicated he was a builder yet there was no equipment in the back of his van, and it seemed so clean and tidy. Then, in 1994, news broke about a couple arrested on suspicion of murder. Later that year, Fred West and his wife, Rosemary, were found guilty of torturing, raping and killing 12 young women between 1967 and 1987, the majority at their home. It wasn't until the end of the trial that I picked up a Sunday paper and saw a picture of the young Fred West, photographed around 1980. I recognized him immediately as the man in the blue van. The three friends gathered together at the mall just joking and laughing with each other when the gents were approached by a seemingly nice enough stranger. The stranger asked the three men if they were interested in making a few hundred dollars posing for nude pictures back at his place. Although intrigued, the friends declined the invitation, all but Tracy Edwards, who decided to take the stranger up on his offer as he needed the cash at the time. Little did Mr. Edwards know that he was going back to the apartment of the notorious serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. The two went back to Dahmer's place where Edwards was offered drinks. Mr. Edwards immediately smelled an awful stench coming from Dahmer's apartment as soon as they arrived. He shrugged it off, but the scent to him was terrible. Dahmer told Edwards that a sewer pipe had busted and that was responsible for the foul odors. As the men started to chat, Edwards noticed boxes of acid in the apartment. Dahmer said he used the acid to clean bricks. The explanation seemed valid enough to Edwards in the moment. The two men continued to discuss Mr. Edwards posing nude while drinking a few beers. Out of nowhere, Dahmer pulled out a knife and handcuffs to put on Mr. Edwards. Mr. Edwards was terrified as Dahmer was only able to put the cuffs on one of Edwards' wrists. With a knife pressed up against Edwards' torso, Mr. Edwards pleaded with Dahmer to put the knife down. Dahmer at this point starts to calm down and directs Edwards to the bedroom telling Edwards that the keys to the cuffs were in his bedroom. Edwards remained talkative throughout the ordeal in Dahmer's bedroom, trying to calm him down as they both sat on Dahmer's bed. During this time, Edwards constantly scanning the room, looking for an opportunity to escape. Dahmer forced Edwards to watch the Exorcist movie in his bedroom. Edwards would later describe Dahmer as being in some sort of trance while watching the movie, rocking back and forth and humming. Dahmer demanded Edwards to lay down on the floor. Edwards laid down on his side. Dahmer laid on top of Edwards, placing the knife at his crotch and his head on Edwards' chest to hear his heartbeat. Terrified, Edwards pleaded to use the bathroom. Dahmer complied, guiding Edward to the bathroom. After using the bathroom, things seemed to settle down as Dahmer appeared calmer. Edwards was terrified by Dahmer as he 
had very aggressive mood swings where he'd be enraged one second and then would calm down the next. The two sat for hours. Edwards desperately looked for an escape. Sometime during the ordeal, Dahmer begins chanting. While chanting, Dahmer no longer holds the other end of his captive's handcuffs. Seeing an opportunity to escape, Edwards hits Dahmer as hard as he can and runs towards the door. Dahmer's attempt to subdue Edwards fails, and Edwards was able to escape the apartment. Edwards was able to flag down police officers in the area. Although the officers were skeptical of Edwards, they noticed the handcuff hanging from Edwards' hand and decided to investigate further. Edwards led police back to Dahmer's apartment where Dahmer answered the door calm and polite. Dahmer admitted to entertaining Edwards but told police they were role playing and having a good time. Unconvinced that crime had been committed, police were about to leave when an officer spotted photos of dismembered bodies. Police immediately placed Dahmer under arrest and put an end to the reign of one of America's most deadly serial killers. It was the night before Thanksgiving. The Pritchett family had spent the day preparing for their traditional Thanksgiving dinner the next day. Exhausted from preparing for the next day's meal, the family decided to go grab burgers for dinner that evening. While leaving they noticed their son Ronald was already eating so they figured he wouldn't want anything from the restaurant. When the family returned from the restaurant with burgers for them and none for Ronald the energy in the house was instantly off. Ronald Pritchett became extremely upset that his parents did bring him back a hamburger. Pritchett's mom and dad attempted to de-escalate the situation and calm and increasingly agitated Ronald down. Ronald's mom and dad would leave their son downstairs to cool off. At this point Ronald was in his own head. He impulsively grabbed a knife and went upstairs to address his parents. Ronald continued the argument with his parents and things start to escalate between him and his father. His mother attempted to step in between the two and that's when Ronald stabbed his mother in the head. Ronald would then attack his father stabbing him multiple times and subsequently killing him. Ronald would flee the scene in his parents' vehicle and hiding out at a relative's house until police arrived to arrest him, bringing an end to a senseless act of violence. But as with most things, Ronald's story is more complicated than an overreaction to not getting fast food. Ronald Pritchett dealt with mental health issues since the age of 18. He'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. His parents spent years trying to get him the help he needed, and found various treatments and prescriptions that helped their son with his battle with mental health. But Ronald was known to not take his medicine regularly, especially when he was away from family. On the night in question Ronald, gripped by a schizophrenia-fueled paranoia that left him delusional and unable to distinguish right from wrong attack his parents. At trial, psychologists testified that Ronald Pritchett's medical records included documentation of bizarre and unpredictable behavior, hallucinations, psychosis, hostility and fear of others, as well as a history of not taking medication regularly. His doctors at trial would explain that Ronald Pritchett didn't recognize his parents and believed that the people around him meant to do him harm as the disagreement over the missed cheeseburger flared into violence. While jailed and hospitalized, Ronald Pritchett refused to see anyone, telling staffers his mother was not his mother. As he started to receive the treatment he needed, his family started to see the young man they had raised and loved again. Ronald Pritchett was found not guilty by reason of insanity. The judge ordered Ronald Pritchett to a state mental hospital, a place where he might find the help his parents sought for him.
After a night of drinking, convicted felon, David Zink got behind the wheel of his truck to head home. Shortly into his ride, he rear-ended unsuspecting 19-year-old Amanda Morton. Before exiting her vehicle, Mrs. Morton dialed 911, reporting she'd been involved in a fender bender. But when police arrived to the scene, Amanda and a second vehicle were nowhere to be found. It was later learned the unsuspecting teen was kidnapped by David Zink. Zink had recently been released from prison and was scared that the traffic accident would send him back. His confession to police was chilling. I didn't decide which way to do it. Yeah. I told her, well, in my mind, I said, well, probably the easiest way to break her neck. And so I told her to look up. She said, up where? I said, up there. When she looked up, I broke her neck. Okay. And how did you do that? Just snapped her with you, just with your hands. With my hands, yeah. That's when I took out the knife and I cut her. I just uh, poked the knife in her neck and then cut it. So to make sure that she was going to remain that way. And I'm under the firm belief she didn't know where she was at. Uh, if, because if she had, she would have known that there was no barn back here. Sure. I mean, common sense would tell you, here's this guy, and he's got you pulled up in front of a damn cemetery. Uh, and I'm walking you through the damn woods back here, what do you think is going to happen next? Zink was found guilty for kidnapping, rape, and the death of Mrs. Morton, and was sentenced to death. Zink was executed after the U.S. Supreme Court denied seven motions, including six motions for stays. He died 14 years and two days after Morton's death. Candy's goal in life was to marry Rich. It was an open secret that she never shied away from. Although she didn't find Pat attractive and his introverted personality wasn't a draw, his earning potential was the opportunity she had been looking for. Pat had just started his career as an electrical engineer and had a very promising future. The couple soon married and had two kids. Candy's bet on Pat's success proved true and Candy quickly settled in as a wealthy housewife. Candy had everything she wanted, but yet she found herself bored and unfulfilled. Betty and Alan's relationship started off well enough Alan worked in telecommunications, and Betty was a school teacher. After the couple's first child, they became a one-income household, with Betty becoming a stay-at-home mom. Betty sunk into a deep depression, and in the 1970s, little was known about postpartum depression. Doctors would often send Betty home with a volume and they promised that she would eventually get over it. The birth of the couple's second child only sunk Betty into a deeper despair, leaving both Betty and Alan in a loveless marriage. The decision to have an affair was already made, 
Bored in her marriage, Candy thought she'd spice up her life by filling her days with romance. She wasn't quite sure of how or who, but that changed after meeting Alan at her church's volleyball game. After a couple of weeks of flirting, the two would eventually give into their desires and start a steamy affair. Candy and Alan felt more alive than ever as they had rendezvous and seedy motels around the Dallas area. For the next few months, the affair was all Candy could think about. She felt more alive than ever. Then Candy suddenly realized the spark was gone. She was ready to find a new lover to spark the flame again. Candy and Alan mutually decided to part ways. Betty Gore's daughter wanted to go with the Montgomery family to see the new Star Wars movie. Candy called Betty to ask her permission, but got no answer. She decided to stop by the Gore's house to verify that Betty's daughter could come to the movies with them. Upon arrival, Betty confronted Candy about the affair with her husband. Candy vehemently denied the allegations, but after being confronted with cards and letters, she admitted to the affair, but tried to reassure Betty that the affair had been over. But Betty didn't believe her. Alan was out of town on business. Alan called Betty all day that day to no answer. He called neighbors and asked them to check on his home. They would report back that everything seemed fine. Alan felt uneasy about not being able to get in touch with his wife and sent neighbors to check on her again. Upon entering the home, the neighbors discovered the body of Betty laying on the floor, her face barely recognizable. It was clear that she had been murdered. Betty's murder rocked the small town of Lucas, Texas. Alan Gore's reaction to his wife's death raised eyebrows. He was unemotional and withdrawn while answering questions for the police. Although strange, it was easy to prove Alan was out of town when his wife was killed. Alan initially lied to police about ever having an affair, but later informed police that he had indeed been unfaithful with Candy Montgomery. When investigators followed up with Candy about the extramarital affair, they noticed she had a foot injury. Candy retained the services of a fellow church member and defense attorney, Don Crowder. Despite her insistence, Betty was alive when she saw her earlier that day. Police had quite a bit of evidence to prove Candy's guilt. Candy was arrested. Most citizens of Lucas were relieved while others were shocked and horrified at the killer's identity. Candy's trial became an absolute spectacle. Don Crowder was experienced in civil litigation and broke every rule in the book defending his criminal client, leaving many to wonder if Candy had made a good choice of attorney. It would turn out to be the best decision she ever made. When it came time for Candy to testify, she shot court watchers with a tale of being confronted by Betty about her affair with Alan. Candy tried to reassure Betty the affair was long over, but Betty refused to accept it. Candy said Betty came at her with an ax, explaining the deep cut on her toe seen by others on the murderous day in question. Outraged at being attacked, Candy claimed she grabbed the ax and began hitting Betty over and over and over 41 times total she hit her until Betty was down it was then Candy said Betty did a very odd thing she whispered shh just before she died it was a riveting tale of self defense but most in attendance didn't believe the jury would buy it 
After all, why didn't Candy just leave after taking the axe away from Betty? Spectators were wrong in their assumptions, as they learned when the jury returned with a not guilty verdict. Candy and Pat left the courthouse to shouts of murderer. Jason Vukovic was a victim of childhood sexual abuse. Jason's history of abuse was from his adopted father. In addition to sexual abuse, Jason's adopted father also used violence and beat the child with pieces of wood and whipped him with belts. It led to him leaving home early as a teenager and turning to a life of crime. Jason turned to thievery to survive and built a rap sheet with local cops. In 2016, Jason's untreated childhood trauma reached its boiling point. While in jail, he began to read through the Sex Offenders Registry of Alaska and decided to get his own brand of justice. Jason would create a list from the Alaskan Sex Offender Registry for crimes related to children, gripping a notebook filled with the names and addresses of sex offenders he found in the public index. Jason targeted the homes of three sex offenders. Jason Vukovic decided to get revenge on sex offenders by becoming a pedophile hunter known as the Alaskan Avenger. Jason pushed the 68-year-old Charles Abbey inside and ordered him to sit on his bed. Jason slapped Abbey across the face multiple times and told him how he found him on Alaska's sex offender registry and that he knew what he had done. Then Jason simply robbed him and left. Two days later, Jason used the same method to enter Andres Barbosa's house. This time, however, he appeared at 4 a.m. and brought two female accomplices. Jason threatened the 25-year-old registered pedophile with a hammer and told him to sit down, punching him in the face before warning he would bash his dome in. He told the victim that he was there to collect what Barbosa owed as one of the two women filmed the incident with their cell phone. Jason robbed Barbosa and stole several items, including his truck. Wesley Demarest heard somebody breaking into his home around 1 a.m. Yet again, Jason had knocked on the door and then forced himself inside. Jason told the victim to lay down on the bed. The victim protested. Jason screamed for the victim to get on his knees, but the victim again protested. This is when Jason Vukovic struck Demarest in the face with the hammer. He then told the victim, I'm an avenging angel. I'm going to met out the justice for the people you've hurt. Jason stole items, including a laptop, and fled. He left his victim unconscious, covered in blood. Waking up in his own blood, Demaris called the police. It didn't take long for authorities to find their perpetrator, as Jason was sitting in his Honda Civic nearby with a hammer, stolen goods, and a notebook containing the names of the three assault victims. Jason Vukovic was arrested on the spot and later charged with 18 counts of assault, robbery, burglary, and theft. 
He initially pled not guilty, but opted to take a deal with the prosecution instead. He pled guilty to first degree attempted assault and a consolidated count of first degree robbery. In exchange, prosecutors dismissed over a dozen additional charges. This led to his sentence in 2018 of 28 years in prison with five years suspended and another five on probation. In 2017, Jason Vukovic wrote a letter to the Anchorage Daily News explaining that he regretted his actions. He blamed his actions on his abuse as a child and admitted he should have sought therapy as an alternative. 